Hello, everybody. How are we doing? NFC 2024 Non-Fungible Conference. It's my first time here, but uh, I believe this has been quite a amazing annual event and uh, really proud to be actually moderating today's session here with OSF. Pretty much needs no introduction if you are in the NFT space or just in the crypto space in general. Um, but interesting fact, uh, in case you may not be aware, OSF, as well as another artist, I believe, who's here, Alien Queen, are actually behind the artwork. You can see over there for the ticketing for the NFC 2024. So give it up for our friend here, OSF. How are you doing, OSF? Yeah, I'm doing, uh, doing well. It's great to be here. I unfortunately missed NFC last year at the last minute and the year before, so it's my first time here and it's, uh, it's amazing. What a, what a place to, to have this event. Very good. Uh, so both, both of us, first time for NFC and I think we're definitely going to enjoy this session here. Um, we're going to talk, of course, about NFTs and stuff like that. Uh, I think you're well known about that, but I think in case, maybe you just give a very quick short summary of you know, your background and how, how you are uh, in this space, what do you do in general? It's such a tough question. When someone asks you, like, give me your background, everyone just freezes, don't they? It's like, what do I say? Um, so my background, I used to be a trader. So I started my career as a trader. I worked in an investment bank for about 10 years. And I first had about Bitcoin in 2012 in Thailand, when someone was telling me about Silk Road and stuff. Didn't see him again after that. but. Um, uh, yeah, I was pretty late in the crypto game. Like, I wanted to crypt, bought my first, despite hearing about it all those years ago, I bought Bitcoin for the first time in 2021. Um, I then stumbled onto NFTs and started collecting things in 2021. And I used to create a lot of digital art when I was younger, um, when I was a teenager. But back then, there was no crypto. There were no NFTs, obviously, and there was no real way to monetize it. And there was just kind of like an online art community. But um, yeah, end of 2021, I just sort of had the itch to pick up a, a digital pencil and start drawing again. So I did and started releasing some, some pieces and some artworks. And yeah, I guess that's kind of what's brought me to here. Fast forward two years from there. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, for most people, they would know you for two specific collections. One of it, of course, is Wrecked Guy, you know, and the other one is your one of ones, which is your own, you know, uh, creative artwork that you've done. Uh, more recently, though, I believe there's been a few new additions uh, and some interesting new initiatives, uh, particularly the one on Blast, I believe. I think Blast, of course, if you haven't if you've been living under a rock, uh, it's one of the hottest chains right now. A lot of people are talking about it. And uh, we've seen some activity in the NFT space over there. I believe you have launched a collection. Why don't you share a little bit more about it? Because I know there's a bit more interactive or sort of like interesting dynamics with regard to that collection. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So, so you know, until a few weeks ago, I'd only ever released artwork on Ethereum L1. Like I hadn't released anything on Solana, hadn't read Ordinals, and I just always felt like that was the best platform and, and venue to release art on. And then came along Blast, which is a, an L2. Um, I think the main net for that launched maybe just a few months ago, and they haven't released their token yet. But they have a very interesting mechanism, which is a refundable NFT. So you can actually purchase an NFT from a creator or a project where, you know, or an artist, wherever it is. Um, and you have the ability to then refund that NFT whenever you want, or whenever it is dictated by the creator, which is kind of like an interesting concept to think. It kind of makes it like a, you know, if you're an NFT project and you're building utility or whatever, it kind of makes it unruggable. Like if you don't do your job, someone can return it. And then as an artist, you create something and someone's like, ah, oh, you know what, this art stuff you kind of shit, don't really want it anymore. Here you go, I can just return it. And you don't have, you know, any, uh, you don't feel any kind of like liability to it. The interesting thing is, you know, how does it work? How do you get paid if they're refundable? And the way that it works is, you know, let's say I sell 10 pieces at 5 ETH each and I make 50 ETH worth of sales. I actually don't get that 50 ETH myself. That 50 ETH goes into a locked pool 
And because Blast has native yield, you're able to earn about 4% on the ETH you have on Blast. You would then earn 4% on the total value that's effectively staked in that contract. So if people don't refund their NFTs, you earn that 4% in perpetuity. If some people refund their NFTs, you earn, still earn 4%, but on whatever that TBL is um, uh, of that vault. And what you can also do is you can make your NFTs upgradable. So you can say, OK, I'm going to launch a new collection, and it's free for anyone who upgrades this existing NFTs. And if they upgrade it, it means you, it actually releases the ETH from the, uh, from the smart contract to yourself. Then you actually finally get the proceeds. So for me, that was a really interesting way to, to release art, because I think many artists will feel the same way. So you, you create a lot of things, and you make a lot of things, but you can't just keep releasing supply onto the market, because then you'll have too much supply, and prices go lower, and collectors will you know, get angry and stuff. But here, this is great. You just release a collection, and it's, you know, it's like, OK, well, it's refundable, so if you don't want it, you can just refund it. Um, and then it creates interesting game theory, like, you know, then the supply goes lower, does that make the existing pieces then more valuable? It's a very, very interesting aspect, I think, of, um, of the POS flow. And yeah, I just found it really, pretty amazing. So I just kind of like jumped in and did one. Yeah, very, very interesting stuff. You know, we tend to see on Blast, everything is about producing yield in some way or another. So it really seems to be in line with what, uh, you know, the whole Blast ecosystem is doing. On, on the wider sort of view, do you think this is something that could catch on? Or do you think, you know, the more traditional route would be the better way in the long run? I think it will catch on. You know, maybe it has a stronger purpose for NFT projects that are going ahead to like build some kind of utility or build a platform where it's like, okay, we're going to go ahead and we have five map points on our roadmap. And if we hit all these things, then you guys should upgrade your NFT and give us the money. And if we don't hit all these things, then you guys refund your NFTs and we don't get the money, right? Um, but I do think it's interesting for artists too. You know, like I, I found it, it felt very liberating to be able to create something and give people the option to return it or refund it. I think if you want to create maybe some more experimental pieces or things that you're not sure of and you're not sure how the reception is going to be, you know, the worst thing for an artist is you create a piece and, or an edition and it's unsold, right? You don't sell out and then you're just sitting there with a the supplier. Whereas this, you can kind of like, you know, it's like no strings attached kind of vibe to it, which I think is pretty interesting if you want to go down the experimental route. So I would encourage any artist to really try it. I think it's pretty cool. And I do think, you know, I don't think it's going to be the main way people will, artists will sell NFTs, but I do think people will experiment with it. Yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens, but definitely, you know, it's, that's what Web3 is about, is experimenting with all these different types, you know, of uh, mechanics for these uh, NFT drops. I, I want to move to another segment altogether, because I, I am aware that, you know, under your wrecked brand, uh, that you're actually launching uh, physical products. Uh, of course, as most of you may know, I'm a penguin, pudgy penguin. And of course, pudgies are always doing, talking about doing physical stuff. So I'm very interested to hear about what more you can share about, you know, moving into physical products. Would you like to share more about that? Yeah, I think pudgy penguin is a really interesting... Yeah, pudgies. <laughs> uh, it's a really interesting case study because if no one knew who Luke Nets was and there was no pudgy penguins and he woke up tomorrow and said, I'm going to create some plushy toys. It's like, cool, well, what's like the edge? You know, how are you going to complete, compete against the rest of the plushy toy market? And that's true of any product. If I woke up today and was like, oh, I'm going to create some soft drinks, everyone's like, OK, cool, man. Like, there's shit ton of soft drinks out there. Like, well, why would I buy your drink, right? But I think what NFTs had allowed you to do and what really this space and Web3 allows you to do is to build a diehard community very quickly and to build brand very quickly and to build IP very quickly in a very accelerated fashion. Like you're able to obtain so many loyal, like customers is the wrong word, loyal collectors or brand believers or loyal community members so quickly that are very sticky. And there's no real other industry you can do that in. So I think there's been a lot of criticism of NFT projects in the past, but it's like, well, you build these communities and then your way to then make money as a company is you then go and monetize them by selling them more NFTs and then you end up diluting the NFTs that they own and it just all ended up in, in tears, right? With all the big VC checks that were written to those big companies and, and tons of uh, NFTs released. So I think actually like using the NFT mechanism to like first build your community, build that brand, build that IP, build that loyalty. 
and then apply that IP to a different product, you then have a head start in that product category because you already have the community, you already have the people who are going to stand by it. So um, I thought Pudgy Penguins was a really interesting case study, and we wanted to do something with a rec brand. We felt like we have built a really strong brand with Rec over the last two years, and I felt like having it just as a Discord full of memes and people getting rugged on meme coins and, and, <laughs> and Banter was probably um, not doing it you know, complete justice. And so we wanted to branch out and do something different and, and build this drink. And what we actually did with Rec Guys, we created a company called Rec Brand Thing, and we gave equity in that company. We're in the process of giving equity in that company to our NFT holders, which has never been done before. So that way, if we ever have any investors, they're on the same page as the NFT holders because everyone owns a piece of the company. Everyone's their equity holders, right? And that way, we're not consumerizing our collectors because whatever, if we sell some drinks, everyone still owns a piece of that company. Everyone still owns a piece of that brand. Hey, if we do really well with these drinks, which you can you know, see behind you on the screen right now, you should have one here. I'm obviously a terrible marketer. <laughs> um, but if we then do really well with this bridge brand and we end up selling it to like Red Bull or Coca Cola, then everyone get, makes some money off it. It's not just me that makes some money off it, right? So, I think that's a really interesting use case of like using the technology you have available to us and the ability to build these communities, then giving people some of the upside in what you're doing, you know, and making it more inclusive. And I think that's much more, I think what we've created, hopefully if we pull it off, we're still early days, but if we pull it off, it's gonna be a really powerful hybrid mechanism between traditional finance, between Web3 and between NFTs. Um, but that's provided the drinks are successful. If no one drinks them, then just forget everything I said. Well. I'm definitely looking forward to see what happens with Rec drinks. I think, you know, if you're able to onboard people onto NFTs using, you know, these drinks, that would definitely be a game changer over there. Uh, in the interest of time, unfortunately, we do have to end it shortly. But uh, do you have any parting words for our people here over at NFC 2024? Or is that? Yeah, I, um, it's amazing to see so many people here. Um, you know, this, this year, the market's obviously a lot better than, than it was last year or the year before. So. Uh, turnouts obviously are higher in the stronger markets, but yeah, it's great to see people have so much enthusiasm for the space. I think it's a really special place to be in, and I think there's a bright future for it. So, um, yeah, my advice is uh, take profits, don't round trip your, don't round trip your meme coins. Make sure you sell before the cycle's over, and uh, have something to show for it uh, in a in a year or two. There you have it, OSF, ladies and gentlemen, give it up. <laughs> <laughs>